Y'all stand with us. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord.
That you are enough for us, that we don't need to worry about anything because you hold us in your hands. You are in control and on the throne, and you love us, and we can trust you. And so we worship you this morning. We give you all the praise, all the glory that you so richly deserve. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Discovery Hills Church, everyone. Uh, there are some connection cards in your seat backs. If you'd like to utilize them, they're welcome card. Uh, let's just get to know you. There's a prayer request card um, that if you have any prayer requests or praises, we'd love to be praying with you. I send those out uh, in a weekly email um, to uh, all, everyone on the church mailing list. If you're not part of that mailing list, you can use those cards to get added to it. Uh, but please let us know how we can be praying for you. Um, and then you can put those cards along with any Ties and offerings, anything like that, in uh, the box that's on the back wall as you walk out the double doors. We have a prayer meeting coming up on Sunday, June 5th at 6 o'clock. Uh, we've been doing those on Zoom, um, and so I send those links out also in the weekly emails. Rocky Railway VBS is coming up June 13th through the 17th. That's uh, Monday through Friday. It's in the morning from about 9 to noon. Um, and we still could use a couple volunteers if anyone wants to uh, volunteer uh, to help out with that. Uh, you can talk to Quinn. Uh, but one of the big things we could use from you is just getting the word out. So if you uh, know anyone with kids, uh, whether they're related to you or whether they're neighbors or however, um, let them know they should sign up for this. They can sign up on our website, discoveryhills.org, uh, um, for the, that week. Um, so, yeah, join us for that. Children's ministry volunteers are needed. We need some children's ministry um, volunteers for uh, the next couple months. Um, we like to, to try to fill the calendar out uh, with volunteers by month. Um, so you, if you're up to volunteer for a month or two, um, in the next couple months or even through the end of the year, um, let Quinn know. She would love to get you plugged in. Uh, if you've never done it before, there is uh, training available. So um, don't think that, that you can't do it. You can. All right. Okay, um, a couple other things. There, uh, next Saturday is the River Cats game that we're going to um, for those who bought tickets. Um, and those, if you bought tickets, those tickets will be emailed to you this week, uh, sent to the email address that you uh, registered with, uh, and that will be sent by Wednesday. So if you haven't received it by Wednesday, uh, contact Sherry Whiteley. Um, if you don't have her contact information, you can contact the church office. Um, and we do still have two tickets available, so if anyone is interested in coming that didn't originally buy tickets, we do still have two tickets available. Or for those of you who are coming, you could invite two friends, right? All right. Um, Share Food Closet is uh, one of the local missions organizations that we support, and they are currently in need of canned vegetables. So uh, if you could bring in any canned vegetables, this might be a great time to uh, go through your pantry and decide, you know, I'm never, ever going to eat this can of green beans. Um, maybe just bring it in. Um, and there's a box uh, that, that's right below our, our offering box uh, in the back that says uh, food closet donations. And so you can feel free to drop those in there. And we take those up to a share food closet. You can bring it in anytime during the week um, or on next Sunday. Okay. Um, I am going to pray for us now. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we, we gather here this morning to worship you and to hear from your word, to fellowship together um, and, and, and encourage one another. And God, we need this time to center ourselves on you, to center ourselves on your kingdom, 
on our mission, on our identity in you. And I pray that that would happen this morning as we worship you, as we hear from your word, that you would speak to us. God, we, we lift up this world in, the, in all of its brokenness, and all of its trouble, and we pray that not only would you intervene in those broken places, that you would use us to intervene in those broken places, that we would be the light in the darkness that you have called us to be, for that you would guide us, show us where we can go, what we can do, give us words to speak, God, that we might be the vessels of your grace that you have called us to be. God, as we give tithes and offerings, we pray they would be used for the furtherance of your kingdom, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Right Right now, uh, we're going to do a new song called Honey in the Rock. And, and when uh, somebody in the band came to me and, and said, I think we should do this song, it's called Honey in the Rock, I thought, well, that's ridiculous. That's a ridiculous title for a song. What does it mean? Nobody knows what that means. No one's going to know what that means. Why should we sing it? But it's, it's catchy. So, um, uh, so I thought, inst- I thought well, uh, uh, I thought I just, it is a, a phrase in the Bible um, and that is used a couple of places, and so I wanted to show you where that was used. Um, the first is in Deuteronomy 32, uh, verse 13, where uh, Moses is recounting how God has been faithful to Israel, how he's provided for them. Um, and it says, He made him to ride on the high places of the land, and he ate the produce of the field, and he suckled him with honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. Now, Moses is recounting Israel's history, but he's not actually talking about a specific incident in which honey came out of a rock. He's just using that as a metaphor for the fact that God can provide for us out of nowhere. Out of seemingly nothing in barren situations, he can provide what we need. Um, The psalmist in in Psalm 81 also references this same thing, probably referencing Moses' earlier scripture in Deuteronomy. He would feed you with the finest of the wheat and honey from the rock. I would satisfy you. Um, And so that's what this song is about, about how God provides for us, how we can count on him, um, how he is there for us. And and so he he references a couple other stories like uh, water in the stone, which is is a a reference to uh, Old Testament and Israel and and manna on the ground, which is another one for Israel's time in the wilderness. And so um, as we sing this, we can consider how God provides for us and how he is always there for us in all situations um, when we need him. So as you catch on, please sing with us. The sunny and the rock, water and the storm. I 
keep looking, I keep finding, you keep giving, keep providing, I have all that I need, you are all that I need, I keep praying, you keep moving, I keep praising, you keep proving, I have all that I need, you are all that I need, I keep looking, I keep finding, you keep giving, keep providing. Go ahead and come on up and help us lead this next song. If you are a third through fifth grader, go ahead after this song and have a seat, and we'll be dismissed after worship. Just if you're a third through fifth grader.
right. Thank you, kids. Thank you, thank you. Father God, we just bow before you, Lord. And that is the song, that is the declaration of our heart that you are above all in greatness, in power, in love, 
and mercy and grace. We are so thankful for who you are and that we get to be your children. Lord, we surrender to you this morning and we ask that you would have your way in us. We love you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. All right, this morning uh, we are um, beginning a, a series in First Peter. And uh, when I was finishing up Matthew, uh, people, some people started asking me, you know, what are, what are you going to do next? What's going to be next? Uh, and when I'd say, First Peter, I got a lot of, um, oh, okay. Just kind of, they're not mad about it, but they're not excited about it at all. That's just like, that's fine, whatever. Um, so I want to explain why, why did I choose First Peter? Well, First Peter is written uh, to uh, Christians currently facing persecution. Uh, and when I, I talk to many Christians uh, today, uh, they seem to think they're facing persecution. They're not. It's not real persecution. Right? And I, I balk to call, I, let me say it this way, becoming unpopular isn't persecution. Okay. We become less pop, we're becoming less popular, becoming pushed to the margins, becoming, you know, those kind of things. But, but that's not persecution. I, and I, 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 I wouldn't call it persecution because there is real persecution going on in the world against Christians today in which their lives are actually at, at, at risk and those kind of things. And so um, while we may not be facing persecution right now, that feeling of being, being kind of push to the margins of kind of becoming less popular um, it is related to what Peter is addressing in this, in this book. Because Peter is going to address them um, as exiles. And we'll get into that in a minute. But he's going to address them as exiles. And to some extent, that's a bit of what we are feeling. We're, as, we, as, as our culture shifts away from what we would call Judeo-Christian values, we feel increasingly alien. We feel increasingly exiled from our culture. Now, there's a strong argument to say we probably always should have felt that way. But, uh, but as we see this change in our culture, we can feel increasingly that way. The other thing is that Peter, while he's writing to them what, when they're facing persecution, they're actually about to face much greater persecution. In many ways, this is a letter that is in preparation for the persecution that they're about to face. It's not actually, um, it's actually going to get a lot worse for them. And so as we see, read Peter's words of, of talking to them as exiles, talking to them as those who are suffering and facing persecution, yet encouraging them to live in joy and hope, I think that there's a connection there for us. And so today we're going to cover uh, 1 Peter verses 1 and 2. That's it. Um, and and it's, I've, I have more pages than I normally do. So as, go figure. Um, okay, so we'll start with, uh, with uh, v verse 1, uh, which is this from 2 uh, kind of uh, verse. So really, the, the whole, these whole verses are. Um, so Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who are elect exiles in the, of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So as we, as we begin this book, I want us to consider what, what happened to Peter up until this point. How did Peter get here? How did Peter get to the point of writing this letter? Because it informs uh, what he's going to write. Peter was uh, among the first disciples called, and back in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 through 20, it tells us that while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. So Peter, Peter was a fisherman who was called to follow Jesus. He began following Jesus. One of the first things we see after that with Peter is that Jesus goes to Peter's house and heals his mother-in-law. So we know that Peter had a family. He was married. Peter walked on the water with Jesus. Um, and by the way, if you pick up the study guides, I have 
references for all of this stuff. There's a lot of a lot of there's a lot more places that I would want to reference than I normally do. So I just put references in without I'm not going to read them all. Peter walked on water with Jesus. He got his nickname. Peter was actually his nickname. Uh, his real name was Simon, um, and and that. Uh, Nicknamed Peter came from him declaring that Jesus was the Messiah. And then later in that, in that same kind of interaction, he gets rebuked by Jesus and told to, you know, get behind me, Satan. That's in Matthew 16. Peter witnessed the transfiguration of Jesus in Matthew 17. Um, he confidently declared that he would not deny Jesus, but then he did three times. Uh, Peter, when, when Jesus is being arrested, he's the one who slices the ear off of one of the guards. Um, and, and, and then after that, so we see kind of throughout that journey, Jesus' journey, Peter's journey with Jesus, there's all these ups and downs, right? There's these real big highlights of these bit bad moments. It's like that you could summarize it all by that moment of him walking on the water because he walks on the water and then he sinks, you know, the whole thing. That's kind of, that's his... He's just up and down, right? He's got great moments and bad moments. And he ended on a, kind of ended on a bad moment, right? right before Jesus is crucified, he denies him three times after saying confidently that he would rather die than deny Jesus. So then after Jesus' resurrection, Jesus and Peter have to have a kind of reconciliation moment. Uh, and we see this in John chapter 21, verses 15 through 19, where it says, that when they finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to them, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Then he said to, to, he, this he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. So Peter takes this call seriously. Jesus tells him, hey, if you love me, you need to prove it. He asks him three times if he loves him in, in response to his three-time denial. That's why Peter gets sad after the third time, because he recognizes that Jesus is referencing the fact, you denied me three times, I'm going to ask you three times, do you love me? And charge you to take care of my people. He charges him to take care of his people. That's what he's saying when he's saying, tend my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. He's telling him, take care of my people. He gives him this charge and Peter takes it seriously. He begins to do it. He actually is the one who preaches the very first Christian sermon at Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. Peter did miracles such as healing. And then he becomes the means by which the Gentiles first enter the church. Right? Paul is the main one who takes takes the gospel to the Gentiles in a much bigger way. He goes and plants all of these churches. Peter didn't really do that. He didn't really go uh, and plant a ton of churches among the Gentiles. But Peter was the gatekeeper, right? Paul was an, an outsider. He's, he wasn't one of the original 12. And he was, he was used by Jesus to take the gospel to the Gentiles in a major way and spread the word through all these churches. But Peter is the one who first opens the door He's the gatekeeper opening the door to the Gentiles. And he's, it's just revealed to him in Acts chapter 10 that the gospel is for the Gentiles as well. And he converts possibly the very first Gentile believers in Acts chapter 10. And then in Acts chapter 15, we see that Peter, Paul, and Barnabas convince the Jewish believers that Gentile believers belonged in the church. They had to convince. It wasn't obvious to everyone. And so Peter is really the main one who's giving this credence. He's giving it uh, validity because he has standing among the 12. He has standing in the church in Jerusalem where the church is, you know, really centralized at the beginning. It quickly spreads and, and 
very quickly they're not going to be able to have the church in Jerusalem in the, in the way that they used to. But they, in the beginning, he's the one who allows Gentiles in because Jesus revealed it to him himself that the gospel is for them as well. So Peter comes to Rome in, in 64, 62 AD. That's when he comes to Rome. Um, and, and so then this letter is written sometime between 62 and 64 AD. He, um, and, and, and we know that because the, the persecution uh, in Rome gets a lot worse in, in 64 AD. In 64 AD, the, the great fire of Rome occurs in July, and, and Nero pins it on the Christians. Right? He blames it on the Christians. He claims that they uh, committed these arsons and all this kind of stuff, and he tries to, to pin it on them, and so then they get persecuted. He's got to have an easy scapegoat, and that's what he chooses. And so he starts killing Christians en masse. But it had already been happening. It's just about to get worse in 64. So Peter is writing this to these churches in, in, in what is modern-day Turkey. He's writing these, th this letter to these churches who are experiencing this persecution. And he's doing it from, from the source. He's doing it from Rome. Um, he's writing these, this letter to these people. And he's writing as an apostle of Jesus Christ. So by the way, we're, we're done with one word so far. We've covered Peter. <laughs> if you look at the passage. So Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's writing not just as Peter, but Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Peter um, identifies himself in this way, and that word um, apostle, or in the, the Greek apostolos, um, has the general meaning of, of messenger. It could be used by someone writing Greek at the time just to mean messenger. But Jesus gives it special meaning um, in, in Luke chapter 6, verse 13, where he calls his disciples apostolos, calls them messengers, apostles. And after Pentecost, when, when Jesus' followers received the Holy Spirit, then the disciples began to function as what we call capital A apostles, in the office of apostle. And that office of apostle carries special authority. It carries an authority at least equal to the Old Testament prophets. The apostles could speak and write God's very words, they were responsible for leading the early church. It's a limited office. There were only 12 apostles. There were only 12 apostles. And so G Peter is writing in that role and identifying himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's saying that he's, his words should be received as the word of God. He's identifying that he is writing scripture and identifying himself as that. And then he's writing, he's an, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the elect exiles of the dispersion. And we're going to break that phrase down word by word because he's, he's writing to the elect exiles of the dispersion. And the first question we need to answer for ourselves is, can, can, we, can we assume that we are elect exiles of the dispersion? Is he writing to us? Okay? And the answer to that question most of the time when you're reading most of the Bible is no. He's not writing to you. He is writing for your benefit. Most of the time you're reading scripture, the, the author is writing for your benefit. You're reading something that is not written directly to you, meaning that when you read the word you, it doesn't mean you. Okay, So the most famously abused one of these uh, verses that people take and try to make it about them is, uh, is Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future, right? Is that saying, I know the plans I have for you? No. He's writing, at that moment, there, he's writing to pe people who are exiled in Babylon, Jews who are exiled in Babylon and telling them that God has a plan for them. The Lord has a plan for those people. And that plan, by the way, is for them to die there, to spend 70 years there. So most of the people there would be dead. Their children will go back to Israel for that big future and hope. They should stay and, and try to make the best of it. 
while they lived their lives out there. So that is something that we can read. For us, we can read it and go, okay, I see that God has plans for people. He probably has plans for me as well. But those plans might not be great plans. They might be like that, where they have to live 70 years in a place they don't want to be and, and, and die there, and then maybe their children have a different future. That might be the plans that God has for me. That idea that is that it's written for your benefit. You're reading about someone else's experience. When you're reading the Old Testament, it's not written to you. It's written for your benefit. It's valuable. We should read it. We should study it. But you can't take every you that you read in Scripture and apply it to yourself. I'll say, I'll give you this, this out. If you want to do that with everything, then you can do it. <laughs> you want to do it with everything. But then, um, you know, we're not eating any more um, bacon cheeseburgers. Um, most of your, your clothes are not not going to work because they're blends, that kind of stuff. So <laughs> to, any, to any extent, the question then is, to get back to our point, is this applicable? To, like, can, can, is this just something we're reading for our benefit? Or could we claim that title, elect exiles of the dispersion? And in this instance, I think we can. Because the, the epistles of the New Testament are the closest we get, are almost the closest we get to things that are written directly to us. Because it's, it's apostles writing to churches after the resurrection of Jesus, before his return, they're living in the same general uh, situation that we are living in. The caveat we have to leave is, is for um, culture, right? Essentially time and place. That there are sometimes reference specific times and places. But in general, when they're saying, here's how I want people in the churches to live. Here's how I want them to practice. Here's the things I would like them to do. For the most part, that is directly to us. These people living in these churches that Peter is writing to are not that different from us positionally. They are pretty similar to us in that they are people who have followed Jesus, who are choosing to follow him. In this, to the extent that they are exo elect exiles of the dispersion, I think that we are as well. So as we read this breakdown, what does it mean when he's addressing them as elect exiles of the dispersion? We need to first consider this word elect, or in the Greek, Eclectos. What does that word mean when he calls them elect? It, that word occurs 22 times in the New Testament, and it always refers to people chosen by God from a group of others who are not chosen and, it, and chosen for inclusion among God's people as recipients of great privilege and blessing. Uh, it's a similar word that's used in Ephesians it's related to the, the same verb in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6, where he says, Blessed be the God of our Father, for of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us, that right there is, that, is a related word to, that chose, uh, to being elect, chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Eclectos is also the Greek word that's used in the Septuagint to translate chosen people when the phrase is used to refer to Israel. Let me Go back and explain Septuagint. Before Jesus uh, is born, um, as, as Greek culture begins to flow into Israel and more Jewish people are speaking Greek, they translate the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek. They call that document the Septuagint. In the Septuagint, there's many places in the Old Testament where God refers to Israel as my chosen people. In the Septuagint, that word chosen, the, the Hebrew word chosen, they, they translate it to eklektos. They translate it to this word, elect, my chosen people. And so as, as Peter's readers were hearing this and hearing him say, you are chosen, you are eklektos exiles, they would be hearing echoes of God saying, 
Israel is my chosen people. They would recognize the fact that that in some way they are chosen, in some way they are elect, in the same way that Israel was chosen and elect. But that is not to say, and this is an important side note, that that is not to say that the church has replaced Israel. Israel has a unique place as God's chosen people. Many Old Testament prophecies concerning Israel are yet to be fulfilled, but they will be fulfilled. God's not done with Israel. But that still would be a comforting thought that, hey, just as as God chose Israel, he chose us. We are eclectos. We are chosen to be what? Exiles. We are chosen exiles. That word can also be translated as sojourners. It's usually not translated as sojourners because it's not a common word anymore. But some of your translations might say sojourners. So not only are we elect, but we are also exiles. And the implication in that word is people who have taken up temporary residence um, in, away from their homeland. People have taken up temporary residence away from their homeland. So this is um, not people who are just passing through. This is people who are going to stay there for a while. But it's also not people um, who are, it's not uh, immigration. Right? It's not people moving into a country and making and, and kind of blending with that culture and becoming uh, of that land. It's people who are temporarily residing there. So as us being referred to as exiles, It's an acknowledgement that we don't belong here, that we're citizens of the kingdom of God, that we should, in fact, feel that foreignness, feel that alienness, feel that we're not a part of the culture, that we don't identify with the world the same way that others do, that we are somehow temporary residents sojourning here. The feeling that I think we are intended to have is kind of the feeling that you might have when you travel to a foreign country. So if you ever go on vacation or go on a mission trip to a foreign country, uh, one of the things that I've noticed when, I, when I've gone to a foreign country that I think is, is really interesting is that um, the advertising doesn't work. Have you ever noticed that when you go to a foreign country? The advertising doesn't work on you. Right? And, and I'm not saying in the sense that, like, I'm not trying to say that, oh, when I drive around here and I see advertising, that I just buy whatever it tells me to. Right? But, but I'll be honest, if I drive by a billboard that has a big cheeseburger on it, it looks pretty good. Right? It makes me, there's, I might not go get it, but there's part of me that wants to. That looks pretty enticing. Right? I see other advertising and I go, boy, I that would be nice to have. Or you see a commercial on TV, you go, that looks pretty good, right? You, you're on social media and you see those ads pop up and sometimes you're like, well, this is targeted really well, <laughs> right? Those kind of things. You, I, as you go, well, that's, it's pulling on me. I'm not going to do it, but it's pulling on me. But you go to a foreign country and you see a billboard and you're like, that's a, what is that? Right? Or you see t- the TV come on and you see the commercials and they just look so silly. And there's nothing pulling on you at all because you're not of that culture. They don't know how to target you. It feels foreign. It feels like, what is this? I don't, it, that doesn't look appetizing to me. That's not something I would want to buy. That does not seem anything to me. That, that, there's some kind of disconnect. And that is kind of, should be the experience of being a sojourner. Should have that sense that this is not our home, that we don't identify with the desires that people have here. The things that they care about are different than the things that we care about because we are citizens of heaven. We are exiles. We are sojourners. So we are elect exiles of the dispersion. Now, the Greek word here that's being used is diaspora. And you might go, whoa, whoa, that's I've heard that one before. Because that's a term that is still in use today to refer to uh, Jews who, dwell, who live outside of Israel. Right? Jews who live outside of Israel um, are called the diaspora. And here... Um, Peter repurposes the term to refer to Christians scattered throughout the world. Um, 
and, and James actually does the same thing in James chapter 1, verse 1. And, and, and so here he's not talking about the Jewish diaspora. He's talking about it as a Christian diaspora. Now, no one would suppose that he's writing only to Jewish Christians, especially considering the destination of the letter. Peter's using this familiar term in a new way to reinforce the idea of there being exiles and sojourners. They're scattered throughout the world. Jewish people had been scattered throughout the world, living in a variety of countries, but they didn't remove their identity as Israelites. In fact, Israel had maintained its identity for centuries without a homeland. Israel would, has t- had, uh, until 1949, maintained its identity as a nation without, a con- without land for a long, long time. And Christians, too, have been scattered throughout the world apart from our true home, the kingdom of God, and yet maintain a distinct identity. That's what Peter is calling them to, saying, you are sojourners. You cannot make this land your land. You cannot make these countries your identity. You are citizens of the kingdom of God, and you need to live as exiles. You need to live as exiles who have been chosen by God to live in this way and in this, in this manner, and you're scattered throughout the nations. And in this case, intentionally. Or in this case, we're scattered throughout the nations intentionally in order to fulfill the mission that Jesus has of bringing this message to the world. The unity of the body of Christ The sense that we are one body is something that should be practiced locally but understood universally, right? In other words, we we practice that locally. We have our church here, whatever church you're a member of, if you're visiting with us today, that, that you fellowship and spend time with and encourage and work alongside fellow Christians in a local place, but you understand that you are part of the universal body of Christ. And so there is some affinity that you have with Christians wherever they are in the world, some identity with them as part of you. It should bring comfort and hope to persevere knowing that there are Christians across the world who are experiencing the same things that we are working toward the same goal and loving the same Lord. And that's what Peter intends to do as he calls them elect exiles of the dispersion, chosen sojourners scattered throughout the world. That's what we are as well. Peter is writing for a specific region here. Most of it's in modern-day Turkey. He calls it Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And, and, uh, and so he's, he's giving the, hey, here's the region of the churches that I'm writing to. But he's also, uh, interestingly, probably providing a roadmap. Because Pontus and Bithynia uh, were actually one region together there. But they were, they, they, they were called Pontus and Bithynia together, but there was one side or the other. And so he kind of gives a, a loop that he's probably giving instructions of, here's the route that this letter should go on. And we'll, we'll get to, at some point, the guy who's going to deliver it. All right, we'll look next year at verse 2. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Okay, so all of these phrases are still modifying the phrase elect exiles of the dispersion. He says, you are elect exiles of the dispersion. First, according to the foreknowledge of the Father. According to the foreknowledge of the Father, you have been chosen to be exiles of the dispersion. And what does this mean? It means that we are, we are um, not just that God knew ahead of time. When we talk about the foreknowledge of God, the foreknowledge of God is not just, the, not just him knowing a fact ahead of time, Foreknowledge often refers to the intimate, fatherly, loving knowledge of a person that God has. Not just his knowing a fact, but him knowing us intimately, individually. The the root verb is used by Jesus in speaking of his intimate knowledge of his people. For example, in John chapter 10, verse 14, where he says, I am the good shepherd, I know my own and my own know me. 
is using the same word there where he's saying, I know you. Not just, that's not just knowing a fact. We're talking about knowing a person. He's saying, I know you intimately. I know you as a shepherd knows his sheep, as a father knows his children. I know you. So according to the fact that God the Father knew us ahead of time, that he had foreknowledge of us, he chose us to be elect exiles of the dispersion. He also tells them that, that, this, that they are elect exiles of the dispersion in the sanctification of the Spirit. That we live as elect exiles of the dispersion in the sanctification of the Spirit. Every part of our existence is lived in the realm of the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. That we're being transformed into the image of Jesus day by day by the work of the Holy Spirit. There isn't any part of our lives that are separate from this. The Spirit uses every part of our lives to sanctify us. And we talk about sanctification. Sanctification is the process of being made holy. To sanctify something is to make it holy. So our sanctification is our being made holy. And he's saying, as we live as elect exiles of the dispersion, we are being sanctified. We are being transformed into the image of Jesus. Not only does all those things happen in the sanctification of the Spirit, but it happens for obedience to Jesus Christ, that we live as exiles of the dispersion for obedience to Christ. Submission to Christ and obedience to his word are paramount in following him. We are made, as Ephesians chapter 2, verses 10, we are made in his, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are designed and intended to obey and follow Jesus and do what he says. Notice then that in just these first three passages, these first three modifiers here, that it is a, that the Trinity shows up, right? That, that this all happens due to, according to the foreknowledge, the loving intimate knowledge of us that God the Father has, he chose us, that our, our chosen uh, exiled lives are being lived in the sanctification of the Spirit as the Spirit works and sanctifies us, and that it is all for obedience to Christ, that our, our obedience, our allegiance, our submission goes to him. According to the foreknowledge of God in the sanctification of the Spirit for the obedience to Christ. But he also then follows that up with, and for sprinkling with his blood. And this is because while we sojourn here, our obedience will always be incomplete. Or we are going to fail. We'll fail to live up to our call. We'll need forgiveness. We'll slip into sin. We will make mistakes. And so we will need continued forgiveness. And Peter acknowledges this fact by noting that we also need sprinkling with his blood. Now, Peter's readers who didn't have an intimate knowledge of the Old Testament, and really probably most people that read this passage, simply take this as being uh, a, a, a way of saying that we need a little forgiveness. After having been totally forgiven, right, because we often talk about being washed in the blood, about the blood of Jesus covering us, and that being our salvation, right, that we are saved, that we are washed clean, that our righteous, Jesus' righteousness becomes ours by our acceptance of him as Savior and Lord. And, we, and so that's a total, that's all of his blood that, that washes us clean, right? So then if we just need a little sprinkling, that's just the bit of forgiveness that we need as we move through our lives and, and attempt to follow Jesus but fail sometimes. And that's an okay way to understand it. But Peter's readers who had a more intimate knowledge of the Old Testament may have noticed this as an allusion to Leviticus chapter 14 where, uh, where Moses lays out the purification ceremony for a leper who had been healed from leprosy. Because someone who had been healed from leprosy wasn't, uh, wasn't exiled from the community, right? Even someone who had leprosy was still a chosen 
member of God's people, right? He was still part of God's chosen people. He had not been kicked out of God's people. He wasn't cut off from his people, as, as uh, the Old Testament talks about, when people sin in a major way and they have to be cut off from God's people when they live in rebellion. A leper, that wasn't the case, right? They needed to be cleansed, but they weren't cut off from God's people. They just needed this purification ceremony. And that's kind of what Peter is alluding to here, this idea of being sprinkled with his blood because we just need to be purified sometimes. We're not cut off. We're not going to change who we are. We just need sprinkling with his blood sometimes. And Peter ends this introduction by saying, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. And this could be taken as a simple greeting, but it could also be in many ways taken as as Peter's thesis statement for the whole letter or some kind of um, even just preemptive uh, note, right? Because he's, his intention here is for them to receive grace and peace. He wants them to know, everything I'm writing to you, I want you to receive grace and peace as a result of it and in preparation for it. Because grace is God's freely given undeserved favor towards his people. Peace is a result of having experienced God's grace and mercy. And so Peter wants them to feel these things, but he also knows that he's going to have to correct them a little bit. Right? Some of the things that he's going to write are going to be corrective. Some of the things that he's going to write are going to re- be rebuke. He's going to rebuke them. And so he wants them to know that, and this is such an important thing, no matter how you hear commands from God, or correction in whatever form, whether you're reading, uh, uh, reading the Bible and, and just hearing it for yourself, or whether it's being preached to you in a sermon, or you're hearing it in some, uh, reading some other book or something like that. Whenever there is correction, it always must be received with grace. It always must be received with grace and mercy and with a sense of peace, because it's not about what we've done, it's about what he's done. And so as Peter is saying, I'm going to correct these things, recognize that it's all in grace that you are going to make these corrections. You're not going to change your behavior by, by all of a sudden now just taking the, your, the righteousness in your own hands and trying to, to do your best. It has to be, you can only be changed by grace. You can only be changed by grace. And so as a result, we live in peace. Because it's not, there's no anxiety about, I have to change, I need to do this, I need to do that, and if I don't get it right, then what's going to happen to me? No, it's all covered. It's all already been covered. If you make a mistake, it's, it's still the grace of Jesus that covers you. If, you've re- if you find out in the middle of, uh, of the day, like, oh, I've been, I didn't even know this was sin, and now all of a sudden the Holy Spirit's revealed it to me, you know, are you going to be ranked, you know, racked with anxiety and, and worry and all this? No, because it's all covered by Jesus should all be always received with grace, and that should allow us to live in peace. That allows us to live with that sense of peace because while we want to please him, while we want to live for him, we want to live for obedience with Christ, but it's not going to always be perfect. We need grace, and that grace should result in peace. I'll wrap up with this, three takeaways for today's message. Number one, embrace your identity as elect exiles of the dispersion. I think it's such a powerful term um, for us as Christians, right? That, I mean, Peter could have just said, like, hey, I'm writing to all the Christians in these places. Right? He doesn't. He gives them this title, elect exiles of the dispersion. Chosen sojourners, people living away from their homeland, scattered throughout the world. That's who we are. In Jesus. Embrace that identity. Number two, recognize every part of your life as a means of sanctification. Recognize that you're always being transformed. You're always being changed in every part of your life, whether you're at work or whether you're here at church or whether you're you know, practicing your hobby, whatever it is, it all can be used to change you and it all should be recognized as a, a realm of the Holy Spirit in your life to, to work in you. And last, live in grace and peace as you seek to obey Christ. I'm going to pray here in just a second, and then we'll take communion together, uh, and then we'll sing one final song, and then 
Um, if you'd like prayer for anything, there'll be a prayer team that's available right over here afterwards. Would you pray with me now? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this letter that Peter wrote. We thank you that you charged him to care for your sheep and that he took that call seriously. And I pray that we would take the calls you've put on our lives seriously as well, that we would recognize ourselves as being chosen by you, but chosen by you to be exiles, to live as people apart from their homeland, because our true homeland is the kingdom of God. We are citizens of, the, of that kingdom. I pray that we would recognize that we are not alone in this, that there are Christians scattered around the world seeking to take your gospel to every corner of the earth. I pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. On the night that our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and breaking it, he blessed it and gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When they had eaten, he took the cup and blessing it, he said, this is my blood of the new covenant Poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Promise you will carry me safe. 
Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I send you to take the love of Jesus, the hope of the gospel to everyone you encounter this week. Amen. If you'd like prayer for anything, we'll have a prayer team right over here.